Uh, Joan, you've done like how many shows? It's a little bit less. How many shows do you think you've shot throughout your career? Over a thousand. Probably. Over a thousand. Considering it's between Washington, D.C., off Broadway, off off Broadway, regional. And Broadway and tours, probably close to a thousand. And let's just do some quick numbers because we like data yeah. here. So literally, so, you've taken a like a, a million, million or more, a more photos. Yeah. I wanna be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. You're listening to the Producers Perspective podcast with your host, Tony Award winner Ken Davenport. Hey everybody, Kent Davenport here. In just a few minutes, we're going to get to Joan Marcus, the Tony Award winning photographer, and hear her story about how she built her career as one of the Broadway photographers out there and all the entrepreneurial activities she engaged in before she found photography. But speaking of entrepreneurs out there, uh, this podcast sponsored by something we are doing here at the office that we are very excited about. So as you may know, I have this mission to help get 5,000 shows produced by 2025. We call it 5,000 by 2025. Pretty simple. So in all of our research and in talking to all you entrepreneurs out there, writers, directors, actors, and everybody who wants to get a show on, uh, we hear over and over again that you need help with marketing. You need help with branding. What should a website say? Uh, what should a demo look like? How do I be more productive? Uh, how do I have a day job and work on my art and my dream job? So we've designed a one-day conference called, are you ready? Promote You. Promote You, the marketing and productivity conference for theater makers out there. Again, actors, directors, designers, producers, everybody. A one-day conference just for you featuring some amazing speakers. Uh, Broadway star Sierra Bogus, Tyler Mount, Tony Howell, and yeah, I will have a few words as well. And we've got some more exciting speakers yet to be announced talking about all things marketing and productivity. That conference is going to take place on Friday, May 17th. Friday, May 17th at Signature Theaters, the Alice Griffin Jewel Box Theater. Go to PromoteYouConference.com. That's PromoteYouConference.com for all the details and to register today. We don't have a lot of tickets and they are going to go quickly. Again, May 17th, Promote You, the Marketing and Productivity Conference for Theater Makers. Visit that website today, grab your ticket, we will see you there, and we will get you to be one of our 5,000 by 2025. And now, on with the podcast. Hello everybody, Ken Davenport here. Welcome back to the Producer's Perspective podcast, where we are delivering a very different perspective on our business for you today. One of the most unique looks at the stage yeah. that we have, because hers is through a lens. Please welcome one of the Broadway photographers, Joan Marcus. Welcome, Joan. Hi, Ken. Uh, Joan, you've done like how many shows? I was going to start this little bio here, but it's pretty ridiculous. How many shows do you think you've shot throughout your career? Over a thousand. Probably. Over a thousand? Probably. I mean, considering it's been a long career. <clears throat> and Washington, between Washington, D.C., off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway, regional, and Broadway, and tours, probably close to a thousand. So a thousand. And let's just do some quick numbers because we like data yeah. here. How many photos do you take of each show when you're on a show? How many times do you press click? Now, I mean, it's like thousands because it's digital and you don't have to pay for it. And it's easier, I mean, now to just take thousands of pictures. So literally so, you've taken a, like a, a million, million <laughs> or more, more photos yeah. in your yep. career. yep. Well, we're going to get to the technology yeah. in a second, but so tell me which came first for you, the love of photography or the love of the theater? Love of photography. So and how did that start? It started in college. It was a hobby and I ended up gravitating towards photography classes when I was in college and I worked in the photo lab there, but it was much more like photographing walls and like fine art kind of abstracts and and I love printing. I was a really good black and white printer. So when I got out of college, you know, I was trying to figure out what to do. And I was going to end up going to graduate school, 
because I really never thought about a career as a photographer. So I was going to go to graduate school, and I, I found out like that I was dyslexic in college. So, in I mean, I could read, but I had trouble writing. I had troubles. That's pretty late. To yeah, realize. it was like, and, and I struggled, struggled, struggled always with writing. I can read, but it was like transposing letters, and it was just really kind of a frustrating kind of thing. I mean, it's a form of dyslexia, I guess, not like what you really think of dyslexia, but I had like this thing about writing. So I kind of figured I'd never be an academic, but I needed something like very specific. So I applied to graduate school for landscape architecture. I had to get all these other jobs to save money. And one of them ended up, I had this other job, the AFI box office at the Kennedy Center, which I'd had when I was in college. They had a photographer, and I knocked on his door to see if he needed a printer, and he did. And I guess at the time that La Scala was making its first U.S. appearance, and God knows how long, and there were like six operas there, and the photographer there was going crazy. He said, can you come back later today and help me print? And that was it. And that's when I realized, this is cool. This could be a job. So I put off graduate school. I had three years, which I could take my acceptance. And I thought, I'll do this. This is great. And that's when I developed my love of theater. Although I think I had a secret love of theater before, because one of my favorite things to do when I was in high school, a friend of mine's sister was an actress in Pittsburgh. And at the Pittsburgh Playhouse, they would do like these shows. And we would go, my friend and I would go in with her mother to pick her up, because she was always like anybody and in West Side Story, and she was in Bye Bye Birdie. And we'd second act, and we would sit in the balcony, you know, and go pick her up. And that was one of my favorite things to do. But I didn't know that it would ever be in my future. Ever. No, it wasn't a plan. It was not a plan. <laughs> so then, you know, I was at the Kennedy Center. All this, you know, stuff was, was new. And all this really interesting things were coming. And a lot it was a tryout house for Broadway. Roger Stevens ran it. And he and Robert Whitehead and... Um, Wait, Richmond Crinkley? Yeah, Richmond Crinkley. They would pr bring shows there, and then they would go to New York. And so, you know, I stayed there for about three years, and then I decided I was going to be a photographer. So the only thing I knew really was theater, theater photography. So I started getting jobs, like I'd called all the small theaters and stuff. And it was really hard because like I didn't have a job and I always worried about like making money. So why? I'm, I mean, it was you just, know. you know, because I always thought I'd be a bag lady. I mean, it was like terrible. You know, I mean, I was like always like worried. So I always had so many jobs, things like that I was doing so I wouldn't be poor. And like I, I, I made blue jeans. I had this blue jean skirt business. I mean, I had all these like side businesses because you couldn't buy a blue jean skirt at the time of the gap. You had to split your jeans, you know, cut them apart, and then you'd put, like, tablecloths in between them. You're probably too young to remember that, but it was like... I just made one of those for myself was, the other day. It, it was like, about? so I did, like, stuff like that. And, like, I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but I decided to freelance. And I want to go off on this tangent. Okay. So, because what I, I find interesting is that all of these were entrepreneurial activities. You were creating your own because job. I th Because I thought no one would hire me. I had, like, this deep insecurity that, like, I couldn't get a job. I thought if I make it my, if I do it myself, and if it's okay, then it ended up okay. Except for I did try to start a dog walking business and nobody, it was like really early on and nobody in Washington, they walked their own dogs. <laughs> Not they anymore. totally walked their own dogs. I just love this because so many people actually are insecure so they won't do something on their own. You know, they go to work yeah. for, they take a yeah. survival job or something. You had an insecurity, so you started like 17 of your own businesses. I had these things, and then that went out of business because the sewing machine broke, and I couldn't afford to buy another sewing machine, you know, and I really didn't love doing it anyhow, so it was like that kind of went out so of business. You, you love photography, though, so how did you get those first time you were knocking on doors? So I would do, th people? so I would call people. The thing about Washington that's different in New York, in Washington, at least it used to be like this. If you knew people, okay, 
you'd get a job. I didn't only do theater photography. I did like lots of events, okay, a ton of events and parties and things like that. So I had this little extra money. And even if I didn't like doing it necessarily, I would think I'll get more out of taking pictures at a reception and I'll learn something from that than I would if I was a waitress. So I took everything as like kind of a learning experience. Don't look at this as a fail. I mean, I had these conversations all the time. Don't look at this as a failure. Can you learn from this? Was it how you spoke to someone? Was it how you prepared? Was it you didn't look at your equipment, right? Or you, you know, you forgot to put film in your camera or so, you know, which you they all happen. Yes. That all happened. A lot of the mistakes I made were for not, I mean, every, everything you do is important to the people you're doing it for and you have to do that. But it was for like less <clears throat> high pressure things than like I eventually ended up doing. So like a lot of stuff, it was a, it was like I learned on might have been someone's birthday party where even though <clears throat> that's, it's important, you could go back. You could say that roll of film didn't go in the, in the camera or it didn't advance. You could go back and I get that picture again. So that like a lot of my learning was on things that weren't as high pressure as, you know, it kind of grew into. So let's, I want to get to New York, but I do want to say so, to everyone who may not be familiar with your work. I mean, we've talked about over yeah. a thousand shows, but Joan has done so much extraordinary work in the theater. She actually won a Tony Award for yeah. her excellence in the yeah. theater. Uh, so what was your very first job in New York? So my first job in New York was a show called Lillian in 19... 19- mid 80s 86 I think and that was a show that by the time I did my first show in New York I was shooting for most of the the regional theaters in Washington I had gotten a contract at the Kennedy Center and you know I had all these other jobs too and the Kennedy Center was becoming a real tryout place and I had done, uh, there was a show, it was Lillian, and it was so, starred Zoe Caldwell. And Kennedy Center produced it. It started in Cleveland and then can, came to the Kennedy Center and then came to Broadway. And that show was a really pivotal show for me because I did a very nice job on it. And I met Zoe Caldwell and Robert Whitehead. After that show, they produced another show. When that was coming to Broadway, they called me to see if I wanted to do it. That was my real first Broadway show. Then I started getting my name out, was out a little bit more than it had been. And then Les Mis came to the States in 1987, and it played the Kennedy Center. And I didn't do anything with it, really, other than I printed pictures for them because they came with their photographers. And one was uh, Michael Lepore Trench, who was from London, and the other one was a photographer named Bob Morshack, who I guess had been up at Williamstown, and um, Richard J. Alexander had been there, and he brought him on to be the second shooter and assistant. And I, you know, met them. You know, I met them, and I drove their film to the lab, and I printed their black and white prints, what ended up happening is Bob and I became friends. And then when he did all the reshoots, um, he brought me on as their sec- his second shooter. Okay. And that's when I started shooting kind of the Les Mis. And I was the second shooter, and it was great. And this- then <laughs> Bob became a movie photographer. Like he, he became a unit photographer and a special, special photographer on films, and he was away all the time. And so when that happened, then I kind of took over for the the lame is things here. And that was the big musical stuff. And that's kind of where I started. And I was living in Washington. So then I got a couple more jobs in New York. I got Aspects of Love. I was the second, second shooter on Phantom. That kind of started to bring me up to New York a lot. And how do photographers get their gigs? Is it... Is it the producer? Is it the actor? Is it the press rep? Like it's everything. everything. It's like it's like it's kind of every, it was like kind of an every everything. You know, it was it was kind of like for me it was 
being at the right place at the right time, at the right place in my experience, you know, what I could handle, what I wanted to do. And then what was kind of going on in New York? I mean, because Martha Swope had been here for a long time. She was getting older and was kind of doing less. I mean, it was kind of like a perfect storm in a way when, you know, I came up. And then um, I did a show in Washington called Largely, Largely New York, which was Bill Irwin. It came to New York, and they used my pictures. What happened was my the person I worked for at the Kennedy Center's husband couldn't go to the opening, and she asked me if I wanted to come up to the opening, and I said yes. It was pouring rain, and she said, I'm meeting this person for drinks before the show, and you're more than welcome to join us. And it ended up being Adrian Brian Brown. She then thought, hmm, this would be a great couple because I had just broken up with a boyfriend and he had broken up with a girlfriend. And so he was coming to Washington and she had a barbecue and I took him to the train station. And then I was coming to New York um, to show my portfolio to People Magazine and we had dinner and that was, that was it. And so then, you know, I started dating Adrian. And so, truthfully, I didn't want to leave Washington, you know, because I, it was, it's a very nice place. And it was really, I loved it there. But it ended up that, like, there was way more opportunity for me here. In so many that, ways. In many fun. ways. So, coming up, you know, put me into, like, you know, had I just come up here on my own, it probably would have been a, a lot harder. I probably never would have done it, truthfully. But... That put me in the theater, kind of. And he, his business, that he hadn't started his business yet, but he was working for someone who was leaving the business, and he gave him some clients. And then Adrian started his business, like right at the same time. We're talking about Adrian Brian Brown, uh, the powerhouse uh, press rep who's been on this podcast yeah. and has worked on my show. Yeah. You guys have been called like a in top... It. Broadway yeah. power couple. And you, it's funny because you don't think, you know, it's like you just plow through, you just kind of work, and you, you never think about it. It's like there's an insecurity, you know, that you kind of have. And so, anyway. So what makes a great theater photo versus just a general photo? Well, I, it's a couple things. I mean, it's got to be evocative. It's got to have some kind of movement. It's got to tell a story. I think it does. What has been your favorite photos that you've taken of a show? Like your favorite, if, if the Smithsonian called you today and said, we're going to, we've got room for one set of photos from one of the thousand shows that you've shot, which would you put in? Oh, I don't know. You know, cause like there's so many things, you know, there's so many Things like it's like the enjoyment of the show. Sometimes my favorite pictures are shows that didn't do very well. Like what? Like I loved Amelie's, my pictures from Amelie. And I, I loved working on that show. I did. I loved it. It was so pretty. Um, and what, when you say you loved working on it's a, just, for a it, photographer, what does that mean? It's just, you know, the, it was a combination of like how the show sits in the theater um, the lighting, you know, kind of the staging, just made for really pretty pictures. And you just kind of can go along with it. Like some shows that are really fabulous, like plays are harder sometimes because like a really good play m might be really hard to photograph. Like Proof, you know, was a wonderful, like an amazing play, but you kind of struggle a little bit with something with that because People aren't together. It doesn't make kind of visual pictures, yet it's one of the best plays ever, you know. So it's it's a weird kind of thing. And one of my favorite things that I did, my favorite plays ever that I worked on was at the Kennedy Center. It was Iceman Cometh that came to Broadway with um, Jason Robards and Barney Hughes and um, Caroline Aaron and... That was like just amazingly beautiful production. It's just so beautiful. And then the, I had this wonderful experience where when I was at the Kennedy Center, I used, to, when I, I, when I was working there, I had this whole series of every play that they did there, the American National Theater that Peter Sellers ran. He had this whole series of plays that he did. 
then you'd do the play and then you'd get to do these fantastic portraits. And that, that was a lot, that was fun because I, I felt part of it. You know, I had like more of a continuing relationship with it. And, and that's kind of what I like to do, but you don't get to do that so much anymore just because things aren't done and things aren't done. <laughs> What's and, the difference between you when you take photos at the in previews or at a dress rehearsal and when you come back to a show six months later? It's it it's evolved visually. I mean, the lighting is the the thing that changes. Well, costumes may change and staging may change, but um, the thing that really evolves is the lighting. Because when you come in, they've been in. You know, sometimes it's the same, but rarely is it the same. Because you know they're looking at things and they're thinking. You know, lighting designers are painters, and they think, oh well, you know that's too bright, that's too dark. That should be a different color. And so the lighting really evolves. In a way, it's better if you come back later because you get the full scale of what the lighting designer was going to be do. It's this push-pull because, of course, as producers, we you, want you, you need, you, And yesterday. you can't because it's, you know, you're up and running, and then when are you going to have, like, a run-through? And yet when you shoot from the back of the house, I mean, sometimes that's nice, but, you know, you get a depth and it flattens things out. And you can't move, really, so you can't line things up. And so it's hard, so you have to do it during the dress rehearsal. And so you, we talked about you've seen shows early on yeah. when you come to dress rehearsals, et cetera. You've seen a lot of shows very early in their process before being in front of yeah. the audience. Can you tell when a show is going to work or not now? No. I used to, th- like, sometimes, like, if I get to watch a show... And not shoot it, I can tell. But what I, the more I shoot shows, the more I realize is it's you're just trying to f- kind of get the essence of something. You kind of are thinking about taking the pictures and putting that together. So a lot of times, truthfully, I'm not listening. Sometimes I am, and sometimes I'm not. So I kind of can't tell if something's going to work or not. I, unless I come see it. And sometimes I do, you know, like I'll come to a final dress that's prior to the, where I shoot, where you watch to see what's going on and stuff. And then you can, you can kind of tell what's gonna, gonna work, but not always, you know, like I've had one, I always thought that, um, sideshow was going to be the, the biggest success ever. The original one. I remember walking away from it and thinking, this is a huge, Success. I left, you know, and I watched it and I left. And then I came back a couple times to that one and I thought, maybe, maybe I was like totally wrong, you know, what, and even when I came back, I thought, why didn't this work? Another one was wild, the Wild Party. Um, that Which was at one? Manhattan one? Theater, yeah. Manhattan Theater Club. I loved that production so Me much. Too. I loved it. I thought, wow. What show were they at? And then there was another one, Richard Nelson's Good Night Children Everywhere, which was about these kids who were sent to live in England during, from England were sent, you know, away during the Second World War. It was such a great play. I have no idea sometimes. I have no idea. Let's talk a little bit about the technology because... That's really changed. I mean really changed. Were you developing your own film at the beginning? Okay, when I first started, okay, (laughs) I guess when I first started assisting the photographer at the Kennedy Center, they had, he had, you had lenses, you had to focus, okay? Me too. You had, you had lenses, you had to focus. They were fixed lenses. You didn't use zooms because zooms weren't as good and they weren't as fast for theater. So you had like fixed, you know, prime lenses, fixed lenses. So if you're shooting a show, you had like a wide lens, a, you know, a normal lens, and then a long lens. And so you had all these cameras. Okay, then you had, if you shot color and you shot black and white, you had another set. And in Washington, you couldn't have a second shooter. So you kind of did it yourself. So you had a lot of cameras on you, the black and white you process, but I, I sent it to a lab and then the color you would send to a lab and you would have these things called clip tests done, which were like, they'd snip a piece of the film and process it. And then you'd look at it and you'd say, 
I underexposed. It was okay. I over, and you'd push and pull your film. Okay. And they'd process it. And then you had contact sheets and then you had to print all these pictures. Okay. Then the next thing that happened was, um, I can't remember. I guess zoom lenses came in that were okay. So then you didn't have to have quite as many cameras. And then autofocus came in. And then that really, that changed things significantly. How much does photo approval hamper A lot. what you want to do? Well, it, it doesn't hamper what you do. It hampers what's put out. Have you had a, any great photos that you were like, oh my gosh, this oh, all the time. amazing photo and someone had said, nope. All the time. You know, and, and a lot, and it's, and I, I understand it to a certain extent, you know, because, you know, it's, it's, it's the image of the people that are in the picture. You know, they see themselves a certain way and they want to see themselves a certain way. So sometimes it doesn't make any sense. And sometimes like pictures that have the most emotion or movement or, or ones that kind of sit in the drawer because someone doesn't think they look good. And then sometimes you have seven people that have photo approval in the same picture. And that's a tough one. But what has happened and is that the honesty in the pictures isn't quite the same. I mean, isn't that the way you can shoot now and the way retouching in Photoshop has changed it, you can have the picture where the person's making a bad face and they look fabulous in the frame before it. You can kind of put things together a little bit. Um what about Which, when your photos are used in advertising and marketing? Is there a difference between what just makes a good photo that could go in a frame or on a poster and what you believe is best to sell a ticket? Well, that's all, that's a different thing because that's like art direction. Now, like art direction's great because there'll be a concept, you know, there'll be a concept and they'll shoot it. Like when I first started shooting, you know, like if you had a celebrity in a picture and they were trying to sell a show, they would just put a production picture in an ad and it didn't necessarily work. But now conceptually ads now in front of house too, much better because conceptually they, it all kind of fits together and they're not just throwing pictures in like they used to, which is a good thing. If you could get all the producers on Broadway in a room, what would you tell them that they may not know about photography that could get them better photographs? Well, it's a tough one now, okay, because, like, I'm a product, you know, it's like I've done other things too, but, like, predominantly I'm the production photographer, okay, and so, you know, you get you you get better production pictures if you, I mean, if you had, if you could do, in an ideal world, like, a couple run-throughs, you know, maybe another, you know, so that you can shoot from a different point of view, which kind of makes for more interesting pictures, um, maybe, a, and, and a setup call. You know, that is like the ideal kind of thing for production pictures. Um, but now production pictures kind of seem to take a back seat to like the social media that's going on, because it used to be that that's what people saw uh, with the production was the production pictures and it was pretty monitored you know on when things were released what was released what people could could release and now you know it's like eating lunch with a cast of on saturday with whatever show so you see people's insight into theater is is good or bad. I don't know. You know, it's like you see there's so much out there now. Actors have their own Instagram accounts. As a fan and as, you know, patrons and you, you get so much, you can see so much more about what's going on. And so it's the production pictures, you know, kind of are now not as important as they used to be because there's so much more out there. All right, my last question, which is my genie question. Okay. I want you to imagine the genie from Aladdin comes to okay. visit you and grants you one wish. Okay. What's the one thing about Broadway that drives you crazy, frustrates you? I don't think I've ever seen you without a smile on your face. Uh, so what makes you so mad that you'd ask this genie to wish away? 
can be about anything. Photography, sippy cups. Truthfully, I'm old. (laughs) And I think, you know, I've done it so long. And I'm not skirting. The issue is that it was a little looser, you know, that there weren't so many regulations and rules and stuff like that. But, But I kind of understand why there are. So... Uh, well, I want to thank you for that, and thank uh, you for joining us today. Um, what I love about you is you obviously love your job so much. I'll just tell this brief story. Yeah. I You obviously shot the ones on this island and getting the band back together. Yeah. And one day I saw you in the back of the house at getting the band My back new together. camera. Yeah. My new camera. <laughs> and I was like, Joe, what are you doing? I, we're not shooting today. You're like, oh, I'm just, I have a new camera. I just wanted to try it out. And yeah. trying it out on my show, which, yeah. I, which I loved, and I just... Uh, you obviously love what you do, so thank you for that. Thank you for dedication to the business. Uh, thanks to all of you for listening, and we will see thank you next time. You.